Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good to see that all of you survived the heat this week. Uh, now we have to deal with some humidity, I guess. Fun, fun. Oh, I'm kind of I'm having some feedback here. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. Well, I'm glad to be back with you. That sounds much better. Thank you, Annette. I'm glad to be back with you this week. Um, last week went up to Blair. Jim, Pastor Jim Scrobo is here with you, and it sounded like everything went well. But, and it, everything went well up in Blair as well. Good congregation, got to uh, meet them and, and spend some time with them, and, and got, even got, uh, was taken out to, to lunch afterwards. So they, they, they wined and dined me, I guess. I don't know. But it was a good time. Uh, I think everybody was, went well, and, uh, but I'm just glad to be back. It's always good to be back home and, and uh, where everybody knows your name, right? <laughs> I mean, you're, you, you, you know Jim, but it's nice to be here too. Uh, we do have, I have a couple announcements for you this morning before we get started. Uh, just make sure you sign the wet red welcome folder so that we can give you credit so you're here. Uh, Cheryl has been busy give, updating emergency contact information. So we had an incident recently where we didn't have somebody's emergency contact information and we were very concerned about them because we went almost three weeks without having any idea what happened to them. And we are a congregation that I know is very connected. Uh, we, we are very concerned about each other. We want to take care of each other. And when we don't know what's happened to each other, we we are concerned, and I, and I want to make sure that if something does happen, uh, I, I understand privacy issues and people wanting to, to not, having the right to reserve certain information, but we, we don't want to go three weeks without knowing where you are if we don't have to. Uh, so if you, if you haven't already, if you can contact Cheryl and, and get her some kind of information, uh, an emergency contact so that if something does come up, if we're concerned about you, we can contact someone else just to know you're okay. We don't have to know all the information, but just to know that you're okay. And we will keep that information safe and secure. We won't share it with anybody else. We just want to make sure everybody's okay, everybody's where they need to be, okay? Uh, so we would, we would appreciate that if you, if you haven't done that already. I do have two major prayer requests to share with you this morning, both not great news. I would uh, encourage you to pray for Fred and Carol Scott. Um, Fred has been placed on hospice care, and he is not doing very well at all. Uh, so please pray for Fred, uh, for peace and comfort in this time, and pray for Carol, that she may have strength uh, as she is the caretaker and having lots of decisions to make in the next how many days, weeks, months, uh, to figure out what to do forward. And uh, please pray for Margaret Reese. Uh, we got news that uh, she has also been placed on hospice care and not doing well. So she is out in Sutton, Nebraska with her daughter. Uh, so please pray for Margaret um, that she also have peace and comfort in uh, these next days or weeks or however, however long uh, she's still with us on this earth. So. Please pray for those. Uh, not, not the greatest way to start this morning, but I want to make sure that that gets out, and so we, we lift up those prayers as soon as we can. 
Are there any other prayer requests or information that needs to be uh, shared with the congregation? If there's none, uh, however you are comfortable doing so, please rise and uh, greet one another in the peace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's begin our worship this morning with our choral call to worship, which is the chorus of Blessed Be the Name, and right into the opening song of praise, saying praise to God who reigns above. You may be seated. At this time, let us join together in our unison prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are compassionate, full of tender affection for your people. Although we repeatedly sin against you, you are gracious and kind. Help us reflect your love, mercy, grace, and faithfulness. May we find our deepest joy in you. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For a special music this morning, we have Jody Infante giving a, a solo this morning, and so I invite her up, and may she bless us with her song this morning.
in the darkest hour when I cannot breathe fear is on my chest the weight of the world on me everything is crashing down everything I had known when I wonder if I'm all alone I remember Thank you, Jody. That was very beautiful and a good word for today. For our scripture reading this morning, we're reading from the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 34, and I'm reading verses 1 through 14. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bibles, it is on page 65. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to us this morning. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze 
in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I know I don't often do this, but I'm actually going to allow you the opportunity to speak for a second, if you so choose. But I'm going to throw out this question to you. What's the first thing, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of God? Okay, good. Anything else? Kindness, good. Oh, powerful, all right. Forgiving. Mercy, very good. What is it? Guidance, Guidance okay. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Hope. Peace, hope, good. All right, there you go, Tony, good job. All right. You know, I think this would kind of, kind of be an, an interesting poll, and if we could, you know, have like a big old whiteboard up here and write down everything, it'd be interesting what both... Uh, if we could ask, you know, church attendees and pastors alike what they would come up with, all the different words that, that we would come up with, the first thing that we think about God. As some of you said, you, you think of loving and gracious and forgiving. There are others who might think more along the lines of strict, of, uh, of giving the law, of maybe even being a little angry. Others might say big things like eternal, or unchanging, and I think I heard all-powerful. Like I said, I think we could get quite the list going, and all of them would be a good glimpse into who God is. But the big question that we've, we've or at least I've put forward in, in the next few weeks is, what is God like? And I think that's been a question that people have asked for generations, probably since the dawn of time. What is God like? What's good for us today is in our passage from Exodus today, God himself tells us and gives us characteristics of what he's like. God calls himself by two specific names in today's passage. We're in a sermon series right now where we're looking at the names of God, the names that God gives to himself and also names that people attribute to God and what and how they be help us better understand who God is and what God is like. But before we get too far, I imagine we need to take a step back a little bit and understand what's happening in this text. As I was reading through this text, did anybody wonder what in the world does any of this mean? What's going on? A couple of us. Good. I'm, Colleen, I'm glad you're honest with me because it's a little, it's a little 
complex. So I'm going to try and take a few moments and explain, okay? Well, we'll get to that in a second, all right? Be patient with me. I'll get to that. No, I now. <laughs> well, here. Here's my manuscript. I'll just let you read it. And may- maybe you get to it pretty quickly, okay? Well, one of the major events of the book of Exodus is, well, the Exodus. The, the delivering of the Israelites from slavery under Pharaoh. God rescues his people from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And once freed, God then leads the Israelites to this mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And once they are there, he creates a covenant with them or an agreement. In this agreement, if the Israelites agree to follow God's commands, if they are to do what he asks them to do, then in return, the Lord promises to be their God, to bless them, to watch over them, to care for them. That's the agreement. That's the covenant. That is what we call, that's why we call it the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. That is the the covenant that is the big one of, of the Hebrew Scriptures. Well, everything was going well until it didn't. And actually, it didn't take very long for things to start to fall apart. In chapter 32, while Moses was still high up on the mountain meeting with God and, writing, and, and getting everything about the law that he was going to give to the people, the people became impatient. And they break the covenant by making an idol out of the gold that they have in their necklaces and and earrings and all the things and different things that they have. And they take the gold, they melt it down, and they form it into this calf. And they worship it with offerings and a feast. Well, they're not supposed to do that. That was part of the covenant, the agreement that they made. And once aware of the Israelites' actions, Moses comes down from the mountain and in the midst, he breaks the tablets that had the the law written on it. He crushes the idol and he crushes it into dust and he forces the Israelites to drink the dust, kind of a nasty concoction. And he executes judgment on 3,000 of the Israelites. Not a very good day in the midst of Israel. Not only do the Israelites have to endure Moses' anger and wrath, but God also burns with anger. He is not happy with the Israelites. And to a point that sometimes makes us uncomfortable, God threatens to destroy Israel, except for Moses. However, Moses intercedes and speaks to God on Israel's behalf. Moses appeals to God's mercy, to God's compassion, and asks God to relent, to not destroy Israel, but instead to be gracious. Now, long story short, there's a couple things that happen in between, but ultimately God does listen to Moses, and his anger subsides, And in a sign of of good good relation, chapter 33 ends with Moses receiving a glimpse of God's glory, the backside of God. That's one of those stories that maybe you remember from Sunday school, of Moses seeing the backside of God, of God's glory. And that's where we come to our text today. In our text, God instructs Moses to chisel out two additional stone tablets upon which he will write the law once again. And as Moses chisels out the tablets, God somehow manifests himself besides Moses and declares before Moses his name. It's the name that we read a couple weeks ago back in chapter 3, the covenant name that God gave to the Israelites to call upon him. That's the name that they know him by, which is Yahweh. I am who I am, or I, I, I will be who I will be. And with this name proclaimed, Yahweh, I am, 
God describes his gracious character. He reveals who he is a bit more. God first declares in verse 6, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate. Compassion is a, a characteristic that shows concern for the suffering of others. God loves his own, and, and he is willing to be with us in our times of need. He's full of tender sympathy for the pains and sufferings that we endure. This reminds me of when I was sick as a child. My mom, who is, night, is with us today, I'm going to use you as a sermon illustration as I often do. I remember my mom being very compassionate with me, being gentle and being sympathetic and taking care of me. She would sit on the side of my bed, take my hand, speak softly to me, bring me something cool to drink when I felt warm. That's the kind of compassion that I imagine God is speaking of here, of sitting beside us in our pain, in our hardship. God is full of compassion, just like my mom. Along with compassion, God says he is gracious. Now, what's, what's the difference between compassion and grace? I guess in my mind, I think compassion is good news for, for those who are down but not quite out. It helps them get going again. I think grace is good news for those who uh, are on the fringes, who, who maybe are un, undeserving of things. And grace is a big part of the Christian faith. Throughout Scripture, we hear time after time after time of, of someone or a, the group of people, that, of, that we, of God's people, doing something that they shouldn't, breaking the covenant, being, of doing things they should not be doing. Now, what should happen is that God should give them their just desserts. According to the law, according to the agreement that they made, the Israelites should be punished for what they've done. God is in his, in, in, in his right seat to give them what they deserve. Instead, we read of God's grace. We read of God giving them love, kindness, sparing their lives. And I guess that's what I think of whenever we sing that song, Amazing Grace, or whatever version you use it. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's undeserved. But yet God gives us it anyway. The third characteristic God lists here is slow to anger. Or maybe another way to put it, patience. I like to think I'm a rather patient person until something comes up and then I'm not. <laughs> One of the things that really tests my patience uh, lately is road construction. And oh, do we have a lot of it here in Omaha. I don't know about you, but when I am driving along and having a nice day, and I, not I begin to notice vehicles beginning to back up because a lane or two lanes or three lanes are closed because of road construction, Whew, patience quickly goes out the window for me. But the good thing is God, is not, God does not have a short fuse like we do. While God can get angry, and we see it in this passage, and we see it in others, He doesn't rush to punish us. Instead, he gives us plenty of time, a lot of time really, to, to recognize our mistakes and try to make, make amends for them, to turn back to him and try to do better. Sometimes when I look at, of course, other people's um, actions, I think, oh, God is giving them too much time to make amends. Now, me, God can give me all the time in the world because I deserve it, of course. But 
God gives us so much time. And again, I think that ties into grace, what we just talked about earlier. God doesn't have to give us any time, but he gives us a lot. The fourth characteristic that God lists here of himself is abounding in love and maintaining that love to thousands. When I read this, I can't help but focus on the word abounding. We don't use that word very often, at least I don't. When I think of abounding, I think of the finer things in life. One of the finer things in life that I enjoy is eating lobster. Now, to be honest, before you start checking my uh, receipts, I don't eat lobster all that often. And, and there's a reason. It's really expensive, especially here in the Midwest. And it's always funny because when I go to a restaurant and I see lobster listed on the menu, I notice it often doesn't have a price listed to it. And there's probably a good reason for that. And I know that if I have to ask the price, I can't afford it. And that's because I am not abounding in money. You pay me well, don't get me wrong, but I am not abounding in money that I can just throw money away to buy a lobster. However, when it comes to love, God is not on a budget. God is abounding in love. His love never ends. It never runs out. And, I'm, and to be honest, I'm very thankful for that. The fifth characteristic that God reveals about himself is that he is also abounding in faithfulness. This is a, a, sometimes a hard concept for us to understand because there are so many things in our lives that are just not constant. We never know what gas price is going to be tomorrow. We don't know for sure if we're going to have food on our table tomorrow. We don't know what kind of health we'll be in next week. Things are constantly changing. Things are constantly unsure. We're not sure. Even people, even our own actions, we're not sure if someone is going to be reliable next week or tomorrow or even later this afternoon. We, we aren't always sure. We can, we can know to a degree. There are certainly people who are, are more reliable than others, but we can't put 100% certainty on it. But God says he is 100% reliable, 100% stable, 100% constant. We can always trust on God, no matter the circumstance. The sixth characteristic that God lists is forgiving. The word forgiving comes from this idea of, of lifting up or carrying away. When we sin against God, when we do something that God asks us not to do, our actions can weigh us down with consequences and guilt. But God, in his forgiving nature, lifts those weights away through forgiveness. What's interesting here is that God piles on the words here with these nasty words, iniquity and transgression and sin. What I think God is trying to do here by putting all these things together is that he can handle whatever we do, whether it's a, a small thing or a big thing, no matter how deep, no matter how dark, we can trust that God's forgiveness is greater and deeper. However, God, God's forgiveness does not mean that anything can and does go. God does say at the end of verse 7 that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. For those who do not feel remorse for what they do, do not seek to try to make up or, or redo or, or, or make right what they've done. God does not allow them to seek his forgiveness. God is just. And those who 
do not turn away from their evil deeds, God leaves them to their consequences. If we're willing to do right, then we receive mercy. However, if we don't, if we would rather do what we want to do, then we, God leaves us to it. The big question that arises from this verse is, the, is about God saying that he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now, this is a tough one, I'll admit, because the question would be, why should the children suffer for the sins of the father? And to be honest, that's a good question. I wrestle with that myself. This is how I understand it. I take this phrase, this, this, this word from God, as meaning or emphasizing that actions have consequences. And sometimes those consequences can impact future generations. An example that is pretty weighty, but I think one that does showcase what this means, is if a spouse commits adultery. The person's actions can shatter a marriage and can break up a family. The person's actions can cause physical and mental stress on all people involved, spouses, children, in-laws, extension, however far you want to take it. It can can really, really cause havoc. The spouse who is cheated upon might have trouble trusting again, have trouble loving again, could possibly turn to other means to find peace or comfort or hope, you know, trying to, to numb the pain and, and causing other issues. The children might harbor hurt feelings toward one or both parents and lead to mistrust or misdeeds. And these actions can also affect grandchildren and great-grandchildren who may still have to deal with the lasting fallout of a broken marriage. That's what I think of when it talks about, you know, punishment to the third and fourth generation. It's it's not necessarily that God is saying, well, you've done this, your, your grandfather did this, so therefore you have to suffer. But it's the thought that our actions have consequences beyond ourselves. And so it's important, it's absolutely vital that we think before we do. Not only how our actions affect our own lives, but how they are going to affect others. Because so often they do. The last characteristic that Colleen is interested in is about this idea of God being jealous. And in all honesty, yeah, it's a tough one. How do, we, how do we talk about God being jealous? Because usually jealousy has a negative connotation. When we consider someone to be jealous, we think of them as insecure, clingy, possessive, and not and 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 you know smothering in a way. I don't want to think of God as insecure. I don't want to think of God as clingy or smothering. The way I try to understand this is that the Israelites made an agreement that they would worship God alone that they would not seek gods of other nations or other people, but they would worship the Lord alone. And I think they recognize that they should because as the creator of the universe, God deserves our awe and admiration. And because of what God did for them by rescuing them from slavery, he deserves their love, and devotion.
And we too, because we have been created by God, and God has loved us and blessed us with so many things and rescued us from the powers of, of from slavery to sin and death, that we too should give God priority because of who God is. God takes faithfulness very seriously. God takes these covenants, these agreements, very seriously. It's like a marriage. You take a vow in front of all your friends and family that you will be faithful to your spouse. And when we enter into faith through Jesus, we, when, we, when we go through baptism, when we go through confirmation, when we stand in front of the church and say, we dedicate our lives we will follow Jesus. We too are making a vow that we will put God first. And so just as God is faithful, he asks the same of us. I don't know if that quite answers the question. I don't know if that quite wraps around this idea of God claiming himself to be jealous. But this is what I try to understand it as. That our God is compassionate, gracious, patient, loving, faithful, forgiving, just, and faithful to the nth degree. This is who God has been through the ages, This is the God that we love and worship. And as God gives his full devotion to us, the the hope and prayer is that we give our devotion to him in return. I mean, God's pretty great. I think it would be good to, to worship him alone and not seek other ways. He's given us so much done so much, why wouldn't we want to return some of that devotion? But that's my thought. Let us pray. O God, the God of Israel and our God, we praise you for who you are. We are thankful for your compassion and grace towards us all, and we ask ask that you help us to be faithful to you in all that we do and say. Help us to reflect your own faithfulness towards us as we are faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Alex, so I'm not going to claw your eyes out on my way out. Okay, all right. But we're going to talk about this. Fair enough. It's, it's, it's tough. All right. Would you please rise as you are able and let us join together in our, in our hymn, Standing on the Promises.
be seated. At this time, I invite you to join again with me in prayer. Almighty God, our Creator and our Redeemer, we praise your wonderful name. We thank you for our time this morning as we gather, as we fellowship with your Spirit and with one another, and as we rejoice in your love that we find in Jesus. Oh God, we lift in prayer those who have been greatly affected by the summer sun and heat that we saw this last week, the construction worker, the farmer, the homeless, and so many others. We ask that you give them strength and endurance, that they may recover from the heat, that they may be hydrated and return to health. We pray for the families who are enjoying outdoor activities like parks and fairs and anything that, that takes them outside. Remind them to take care of themselves. We thank you for this relief from the heat and we pray that you continue to watch over it. If it is in, if it is in your will, we pray that you send rain upon the land that is so parched. Sustain us in this present life and supply us with our needs, we pray. We also pray for those among our church family who need you. We especially pray for Fred and Carol Scott this morning. We pray for Margaret Reese. We pray for all those who are feeling ill, who are grieving, who are troubled and frightened by what the future may hold. Be with them. We pray that you strengthen those within our congregation who can speak words of comfort to them, who can send them cards, who can make visits, who can be the light in a dark time. We ask that you anoint them with your spirit. And may you continue to empower them to provide hope and love in all sorts of ways, all to your glory. Oh God, we pray for the prayers that are on our hearts and minds, the prayers we don't have words for, but we trust you here and understand. O oh, gracious God, accept these prayers, and in your infinite mercy may you respond in kind. We pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The offering plate is still in the back by the sound booth. I know most of you already dropped, the, dropped that off on your way in, but if you forgot to do it, you, are, you can do that on your way out if you uh, feel like giving to the, to the mission of the church. In response to all the blessings that God has given us and our returning of some of those blessings to the work of his church, would you please rise as you are able and let us join together in our doxology.
Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. O God, as we offer our treasure and hearts to you, may they be used to pass on the gifts of your hope, peace, and life to those in need. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. May you go forth from this place with the cross of Jesus going on before, the symbol of our God who is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and is faithful and one above all. May you go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.